Uh, Nelson Worley is the co-founder of True Places, a modern outdoor products company that reflects the way we live our lives today, relevant for the most meaningful outdoor moments and at a quality that we expect. The flagship product reimagines the outdoor affordable share, a patented design for supreme comfort, easy portability, and thoughtful features. Prior to founding True Places, Nelson spent 15 years in the consumer packaged goods industry, leading brand and innovation teams. Most recently, Nelson led the creation of the e-commerce division at Campbell Soup Company. And prior to business school, Nelson was a marketing major for Away.com um, and a Washington, D.C.-based startup for adventure travel, content, and vacations. Nelson is a two-time graduate at William & Mary. Um, he has a bachelor's in government and an MBA with a focus in marketing. Um, and now Nelson lives in the suburbs of Philadelphia, mother, uh, married to Heather, also a William & Mary grad. Um, two kids has two kids, Anna and Ellis, and two dogs, Jojo and Emmett. And he spends a lot of time on the sidelines and poolside watching his kids' sports. If they're not playing, a perfect day involves um, a run or a long hike, grilling out with the family, and reading a good dystopian novel. Sounds like a pretty good life to me. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us today. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I'm doing great. It's great to be here. This is a uh... This is an amazing space. I uh, I had an expectation by when I uh, when I was in business school here. I was in classes across the street in Boyle Hall. They still call it that. Yep. So when I when I visited five years after business school, because I knew business school was open, so I, I it blew me away. And similarly here, I I had a sort of an expectation because we had been in a shared space uh, in Philadelphia when we first started, but. This blows me away. It's a great space, and it's so close to campus, and to see everyone coming in and out and the energy here, it's uh, it's great. It, it's I, I'm, I'm uh, very jealous. I wish I would have had this as, a, as an undergrad, but it's great to be here, and uh, it's been about five or six years since I was here, so it's really nice to, to walk around and uh, experience Williamsburg. Awesome. Any government or business school students here with us? A couple? Okay, I see a lot. Okay, so great. Well, it's exciting to have you here with us today, and I think we're ready to move on to our interactive portion where we'll have a mix of audience and guest speaking questions. So um, you can use the uh, code with the menti.com, or you can use the link to um, log in. And once you're logged in, please give me a thumbs up so I know. All right, is everybody in? All right, looks good. All right, let's move on to our first audience question. So what is one problem you're actively trying to solve? So yeah, so um, that's a that's a good question and probably the one you should start with as you're creating any of your uh, your your ideas that ultimately become a company. I think for us, we were. Um, it's a. It's an interesting. Uh, it's an interesting decision when you first get started. Some people have like a position they want to occupy in the in the marketplace. Some people have are very like product led. This is the product, and, and we'll figure out the positioning later. For us, it was it was sort of a combination of the two. I um, my my co founder was very interested in this idea. We we were both at a time in our lives, we were spending a ton of time outdoors. And for us, in our life, it's not, when you say outdoors, a lot of times people go to the great outdoors, hiking, you know, uh, taking your kids on, uh, on an adventure trip. For us, we, we sort of reflected on the most meaningful moments in our lives were every you know, two, three times a week, being outdoors with your kids or, Hanging out with friends in you know in your backyard or in a fire pit, concerts in the park, like all of these moments that that you that you're not taking a vacation towards, but you're spending with the people that really mean a lot to you. And we felt like no brand, no no company was really speaking to people in those moments. There's lots of outdoor brands, there's a lot of sort of adventure or extreme brands, but no one was really capturing those moments. So that was the genesis of for us, like the positioning of the brand as we think about. Our, our space uh, or our, our reason for being in the, in the marketplace. But what we basically started doing is what you all probably do as you're thinking through your ventures. We just started talking to people. We, we were 
you know, a bit older, so we had lots of friends who had similar uh, similar sort of struggles or, or concerns. And we got on the phone or we met him in person. We just talked to him as, as much as we could. And as we started to do that, what we what we found out more and more was a, the, a literal pain point for them was a lot of times they're spending hours in these moments, but they're sitting in cheap or comfortable camping chairs. Chairs that were designed 50 years ago but for hiking trips. And so that was for us the inspiration behind the first product. And so the problem we're really trying to solve is we're trying to bring the comfort that you might find in your patio furniture or your favorite chair inside. We're trying to bring that with you when you go to all of these spaces. It could just be in your backyard, because uh, fire pits are, are a big use for us, or it could be to your kid's game, it could be to the park. We have people that take them, you know, in their RVs when they when they go around the country. So the usage is varied, but it's trying to bring that comfort that you know from home uh, with you uh, wherever you go. Yeah, earlier in your response, I heard kind of um, wanting to find a balance um, within your business and your family, and I, I see that a lot in the student responses here. Um, we have a mix of some students talking about the balancing academics and balancing sports. So I, I see that there's some um, um, similarities here. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think that balance is going to change in your life. I mean, what, what is balance now is going to be different in 10 years, different in 20 years, but trying to strike that balance is pretty important. We're, um, you know, my co-founder and I are similar stages of our professional lives when we started this. So that helped, I and mean, we had some resources. We had, um, you know, we had a stable family. We we came from. Uh, he was in consulting. I was in corporate uh, America. So we came from backgrounds where sometimes that balance is out of out of flux. Um, now you're. It's hard to say. I mean, you, you all are all probably working on venture, and if you think about whether you're working on it or how many hours you work on it a day, it's probably pretty difficult to capture because. At times it can be a lot. Sometimes it can be a little, you know less because you're you know you're doing uh, uh, schoolwork or, or other commitments. For us, it's sort of a similar thing. You're going off school, and you've got family, um, you, you've got uh, you've got fundraising. You have all those things that are that are not necessarily driving demand, but important. And uh, striking that balance is a you know it's a it's a never ending process, and you have to you have to. You have to reflect, uh, you know, every month, every 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 year. Make sure you're you're striking that right balance. Um, thank you for that response. And also, notice that you played a little bit of soccer in, in your time when you were married. I was wondering if you can identify with some of these students trying to find that balance um, as a student. How was that like? I I mean, I did. I actually did better uh, academically when we were. I, I think it's the same for the fall season as the is the bigger of the two seasons. I, I did better in the fall because I had a bit more structure. Um, you know, in the spring, sometimes you have a little more free time, or at least we did back then. So I didn't do as well. But um, yeah, I mean, it's that's whatever your commitment here, whether I mean, one of the great things about William Mary is whether it's athletics or clubs or organizations, there's so much to do here. And so I think all of those things really help and you know uh, make you a better person and ultimately if you want to be an entrepreneur, a better entrepreneur. Because I think what you want to do is, you know, as you're whether it's next year or whether it's five years from now, you want to reflect on those moments when you were here that you uh, you know, in sports they call it in the flow, but um they'll they'll call it the same thing when you're working. Like what are those times where hours just go away? You're not thinking about how much time you're spending on it. You're really energized. And if you do that, you, you'll start to figure out where you're going to, where that gravitational pull is going to be. And so here, yeah, um, sports are definitely a, a big part of it. But I, from probably the biggest learning from sports was really how to work on a team. And that's why, you know, whether it's an organization or, um, or a club or a sport, uh, working, figuring out how what your leadership role is within a team is pretty important because you'll you'll apply that to your jobs. Um, whether again, whether you're an entrepreneur, you work for a company, uh, your leadership style is pretty important. So I, I drew from that, and that's one of the things that was pretty important to me uh, coming out was sort of a, a bit more understanding of who I was as a leader. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, and you talk about reflecting on your time at William and Mary. I think that ties perfectly with the next question. Could you talk about an experience you remember fondly and have shaped uh, and that has shaped your professional career? Um, yeah, sure. The uh, I'm trying to figure out what's probably up there in the entrepreneurial thinking. My guess is probably sits with most with grit as I think about it, because first couple of years I was here. I, I was a government major. I, I, I no offense to government majors here, if there are any. I, I didn't love the major as it, I thought I would. I didn't love it as I got into school. And so I, I struggled a bit academically. I, you know, playing on a team, I struggled athletically. The first couple of years didn't play much. And so those, the, that perseverance, like sticking, it's not going to happen overnight, but like really plugging away at it. Um, that is, I mean, that's, captured in some of that grit and that you'll, I draw from it all the time. And I think if you're a 19 through your early twenties, if you have that, if you're able to sort of draw from that, that perseverance, like just incremental steps and not, not comparing yourself to others, but comparing yourself to how far you've come. I think that's a, that's a really important part of grit that you will definitely have. I, you know, being an entrepreneur is a fantastic occupation, brain can attest. It's a fantastic, it, 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 it will try you and it, you'll, you'll fail wisely, you'll fail unwisely sometimes and uh, and it takes a lot of grit. And I think that's probably, is if I draw from my time here, the second two years for me was really about seeing some of the, the perseverance and, and that fail. Yeah, thanks for tying that back to our pillars. I yeah. think it really shows how um, it reflects in real life. Where are those government majors again? <laughs> I think it's it, business. Well, I will tell you, I am a government major, um, and I hear you on that. <laughs> uh, okay, so we're going to jump into our next um, interactive question. Um, it's going to populate in a word cloud. Um, so we're asking, what makes a solution effective? And you can respond in short answer form. And then if you can think about the true cases or even in your personal life, um, what you think makes a solution effective. Maybe you see any similarities as well. I think, um, I mean, I think for me, it, it addresses a, a problem or an issue. I think that's the, you know, you, you can have an effective solution if you're if you're going into the world of entrepreneurship. I, I think it's not only is it a, an effective, is it the solution effective, but are they willing to pay for it? Uh, whether it's a product or a service, I think that's really important. And that's something, uh, at least in my experience, uh, and corporate innovation and then in the entrepreneur uh, world, people don't ask all the time. You'll it, whatever your venture is that you're you're working on, you might talk to your friends or friends of friends to, to get some learning from them. And hopefully you start to see whether your your idea is addressing a problem. But trying to get to what they're willing to pay for that is it's not always easy. And it takes some some probing. No one's ever going to give you the, the right answer. Like, no one's going to give you a single answer. Um, but even like tips, like, um, you know, what would be what would be a, a normal price for this? They're probably going to give you a pretty low price. And then you might say, well, what would be, what price would be prohibitively expensive? And they're probably going to give you the price that they're just willing to pay for. Like, examples like that start to get at not just is your solution effective, but can you actually make it and make money? Um, I think those are some of the things that kind of fall down sometimes in research. I think a lot of our students agree uh, that I see meet, meets and need is a big one, and that's something you touched on, cost effective as well. Um, so yeah. Okay, with that, um, I think we can move on to our last interactive question. So we ask usually our guest speakers a variation of this question, and today we're asking to rank your pillars of uh, the pillars of entrepreneurial thinking based on your level of mastery. So the first one would be something you think you're really strong at. Do you want to 
Yeah. Sure. Um, I, I think probably most of my experience, if I draw it from before the um, before the startup and and then during it, you know, opportunity discovery it certainly uh, sits squarely in there. You're always trying to find opportunity, whether you're in corporate America or a, a startup. Um, so, and that that's one where if you know if in a couple of years. You know, if someone else took over two places, probably go back to that opportunity discovery, much like you all are doing in these spaces. Um, the one that's probably the most interesting right now uh, is collaboration. And uh, you know, I, I looked at these and thought, where where would we want to build mastery? Where where do we need to um, as, a, as a company in the next couple of years? And it's probably in the collaboration. We produce... 99% of the category that we're in produces in China. Um, and we, we like our factory to find as we scale up, as we continue to scale up, there's been challenges. Um, there's also 25% punitive tariff uh, on the category uh, because of, uh, of production in China. And so looking at other, other factories within the country, other countries where we can manufacture and not, not uh, uh, pay this tariff, it's probably going to require collaboration, whether that's finding another factory or another company and using some of their resources. So that is that's one that where I think we're going to have to get a lot better at in the next uh, couple of years. And it seems like for students, grit was something they showed the most level of mastery. And I think what you mentioned, collaboration is super essential, especially for the students in the business school with group projects and things of that nature. Um, so yeah, um, now we're going to dig deeper into um, your venture and kind of how it came to be. So pivoting, um, take us back to the beginning before your venture was a reality. How did you initially discover the opportunity? Yeah, I, I think I, if, if I've got a little bit of time, I think I'd probably start with, I mean, ultimately my transition was from corporate America to, to a startup and having spent 14 years really coming out of business school thinking, all right, I'm going to take a brand associate brand manager role and I'm going to continue to stay in, in brand management, probably in consumer packaged goods. And that would be my career. That's what I thought coming out of here for late twenties when I, when I did that, um, 10 years into that, you start to question whether that's what you want, but ultimately what, what that is that the ambition is that the sort of the goal you want uh, for yourself. And it, it doesn't come overnight, but over courses of, of a year or two, there's about to be a question whether that's the path for you. And so that's that's what was happening for me. Ultimately, I got to a point where I could say uh, the, the path of vice president or general manager at a, at a large company, it, it was what I wanted originally, but it's not what I want now. And I started, the, one of the benefits of working in brand management is you're exposed to all parts of the business. And I spent a lot of time in innovation and became more and more interested in that. Partnered, found, uh, reconnected with an old uh, colleague, um, and we started talking about this venture. And then ultimately we made the leap, leaving very secure, well-paying jobs to, to do it. Um, but we we ultimately, um, I was telling Graham, we were in a space, he went to um, Penn, so he, he was a work grad, they had a space similar to this. So we just started meeting there for you know, six months prior to the pandemic and collaborating and trying to, to flush this out. And then, um, and then the pandemic happened. We were, we were fortunate to, to have the industrial design done. So the steps for us were we, part, we found a good industrial designer in New York. He designed it. It looked beautiful. Uh, the engineering needed a lot of work. And so we had a good friend uh, in Philadelphia who has a ton of engineering experience. So we worked with him really during the pandemic. Uh, and then uh, from there, we did a Kickstarter campaign. So uh, we happy to talk sort of uh, the, the fundraising component of this, but that was one, one of the parts. Not only did it help secure some capital for a production run, because we had a, we had a successful uh, Kickstarter campaign, it also demonstrated some, some traction for uh, investors. And so, you know, at the time they're looking, the e-commerce was not as attractive as other industries. They're looking for some of those proof points and, and that helped uh, uh, bring on a few angel investors. And so we 
we it's, it took us forever uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we, we could not go to the factory. We had to work remotely, which was challenging. But we produced the product, fulfilled it for our Kickstarter backers, and then launched. And we launched in the sort of the late fall of 2021. And so last the last two years have really been our, our, our two flow years in market, almost purely direct to consumer. We do a little bit of pop-ups. So we'll go to tournaments or trade shows, RV shows. We'll, we'll do some of that, but the bulk of it is, is direct to consumer. Um, and so the last couple of years, we've just learned and, and we've grown every year. This year, uh, we have pretty big growth expectations, but if we can do that, then next year, we could probably start to look at getting into retail. And so that's that's sort of the business trajectory. Uh, but the reason, the, the way it started was just a couple of people talking and having an idea and talking to other people about it. So um, the rest is history. Can you tell us more about a make or break moment or a turning point where you felt that everything changed? Um, make or break moment. Um, you know, I mean, if there there were there were a number of them early. I, I think as you're as you're you have an idea of the solution in your head as you're talking to people that um, that starts to form, and then whatever prototype you 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 make. If, if there's going to be things wrong with it, but if people can respond to it, then that that is that gives you energy. Um, I, I think even a make or break, if you know, just in full transparency, last last summer we were doing our sales were okay, they weren't great. We figured out a couple of things on the price points. We encouraged multiple uh, purchases. We figured out a couple of things with the advertising, and we had addressed some of the product issues, so we were getting more word of mouth. And those three things in combination really <laughs> change the trajectory. So you're, you know, I mean, as you know, if you have a venture or, or you know, when you finally launch it in June and July, you're like, I, we're not sure what we have. By August, September, October, the business was taking off, and you're 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 now responding, trying to meet up with demand. So that's how quickly, at least in our industry, things could change. And so. That was certainly a, a make or break moment. Yeah, I didn't think it would happen that late in, in the life of the, of the startup, but it does. And there's probably gonna be more of those where you think things are, are trending one way and they, you know, it turns on. Yeah, and I saw um, there was a comment on the mentee about someone uh, trying to look for fundraising for their own um, business. Yeah. Uh, can you talk more about uh, what it's like to start your own business going from corporate into, you know, making your own thing. Definitely. I mean, it, I, I would say, you know, everyone's, you're all working on something in a different industry. So some industries are, are more attractive than others. If you're not in one that's super attractive and you, you, you're not going to have venture capital sort of falling, uh, you know, falling in front of you, I, I think my answer is you just, you have to diversify. And I, I think our story of like, a Kickstarter campaign, so a creative way to get some capital. Um, we talked to a lot of people in our network and then asked them about people in their network to try to find angel investors. There's no there's no direct path to that. You just have to pitch it and hopefully ask enough people. Um, we, also, we also got better when we were pitching it to angel investors at the end, if they were somewhat interested, asking if they knew you know, anyone else that might be interested in that sort of simple question. Had uh, you know, um, uh, elicits you know three or four other people that you can talk to. So, uh, Kickstarter angel investor, you know, we we are through Shopify, so we're we're operating through Shopify. You know, after a couple of years of success, we're able to use some of their rev sharing program. We have a you know we have a line of credit through our through our bank now that we've been a couple of years. So, trying to trying to to manage cash flow is a uh, it, it's a tough. It's a tough part, especially when you're not you're not fully at the scale that that we need to be, and it just takes a number of different. If, if you're banking on one, you know, one angel investor or one VC coming in and and, and you know funding it, it's it's probably not going to happen. Now you, you have to have to get creative. That would be my that would be my my long my long winded answer at that. Alrighty, and thank you so much for sharing that part of your venture story. Um, and just for us to get a better idea of true places and um, the products that you sell, we're going to move into the venture demo portion. 
Um, if you could tell us more about your venture, I saw on your website you you talk about how it's a um, very human centered product. Um, so I'm sure you thought a lot about the different components of your product. Can you talk about kind of your competition and, and if you want to go on? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think when I, I think when we started, we thought it would be uh, you know we were both we both had kids that were. You know, when your kids are small, they're not they're under five or six, like you're not sitting down for anything. You're you're riding around chasing them. You get to a certain life stage and uh, you have more more time. And so our, our consumer target falls into people that are a bit like our life stage. My co-founder and I, we have kids, we spend time on the sidelines, uh, we go to concerts in the park, things like that. That's like half of our business. The other half of it is uh, it tends to be like empty nesters, you know, somewhere in their fifties, they have discretionary income, they have lots of time and they want to spend it out outdoors and trying to, trying to please both of those consumers, it, they're, they're different needs, but one of the commonalities is they want comfort. They're sitting for hours. They want comfort. And what we learned, uh, through launching and getting their feedback is they want uh, they want stability too. They want something that is sturdy. The more the more we got into it, the more we learned that ultimately what they're looking for is something that is like a patio chair, but that you can take with them. So that is when we say human centered design. That was really the inspiration behind as much of the engineering as the industrial design. So what we did was we created what you're seeing. If you could just go to the, can you click on portable chair that that link? Do you want to? Yeah, uh, that's a good. You can scroll down. Do you want to control? Oh, uh, sure. Um, so the fabric is a bit more like a, like an outdoor fabric. It's a custom blend. The arms that you'll uh, I'll, I'll bring it take it on a second. The arms are rigid. So there's it's a unique, the patent is on the folding design. The arms are rigid. No one's going to tell you that's comfortable. They're not going to tell you explicitly, but when they sit in it for a long time, not only does it provide stability, that's a big source of comfort actually having that. If you think about sort of traditional camping chairs, they're like cloth, they're, they're you know, they're, they're cloth and you, your, your sort of elbows sink in. Also, what was important on comfort, what we learned was most people sitting in a camping chair, like you go buy a $20 camping chair at Walmart, you're, you're sort of, you're sort of scrunched in. It, it's not meant to like be a, an actual uh, patio chair. So it's not meant to be taught, but we, what we're trying to do is create a design that not just looked like a chair, but had tension in the seat so that you could actually sit in and you wouldn't just sort of plop down and feel like you were in a, a sort of nest. So that those were sort of some of the sort of inspiration. Um, those are some of the consumer uh, touch points that led to the to the design. What uh, what does research look like for your team? Um, I know I took a customer insights class, and it looked like us following people around in Target and seeing what they're shopping for. But what does this look like for? I mean that that's good too. I mean for us in our in this category, if you go to Walmart or Target, it's a uh, it's one of the more depressing aisles. It's like these cheap, uh, you know, chairs and sleeves. You can't see it. You can't. You can't experience. It. That's important. Um, I would say I came from decades of experience, and I still, I, I still, it took me a long time to actually show someone the prototype. We, we just wanted to get it right, and that's your instinct. You're you're going to develop something. You're going to feel like very precious about it. But I would say get over that. Just get it in front of someone. It's going to be wrong. There's going to be issues with it. But you learn a ton from that. So our first chair that we created, like I, it didn't open and close. It, we were worried that someone's going to sit in it, what was going to happen. But we just learned a ton, and that's I, that would be my biggest advice: is just just get it in front of people and let them experience it. If it's online, get the get in front of them and let them experience that that service, whatever you're providing. It, it, the the earlier you can do it, the more you'll learn. Yeah, I think that's a great part of failing wisely and trying to create that minimum viable product and getting it out there really That's quickly. Exactly um, did you want sure. to uh, demo? So uh, it comes in a carrying bag. If you think about the, the, the portable chairs, oftentimes they come in that sort of cheap sleeve. You can't get the chair back in. 
So that was important to us. Um, so it's about 11 pounds. We're trying to get it lighter. Um, a lot of people like the, the heaviness of it, but if you're carrying two and you've got kids in tow, it can, it can be a little, uh, little heavy. So we're trying to lighten it up. But essentially, the inspiration was not just outdoor chairs. We were trying to design it as you would like a stroller. If you think about strollers, like there's a couple of steps, but once you do it, it sort of unfolds and you're good. It takes a couple of chances, a couple of tries to get it right. This is a little bit of, of how ours works. So the arms are the, the patented uh, the patented part of it. They fold out and just it just opens and, and closes like 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 you might have for a stroller. A lot of the a lot of the buyers have spent you know five six years um, uh, you know using strollers, so they're very familiar with the the opening and closing. Yeah, and so it, um, there are accessories. This one's got a cell phone holder. You can get buy a cup holder, accessories that you can move around uh, the chair. Most people buy uh, the bundle, uh, both accessories when they buy it. Most people buy two um, because they're looking to buy one for them and their significant other. So that's good as you think about customer acquisition costs, uh, pretty high order value. Well, thank you for sharing that uh, demo with us. Um, I've heard in classes that a lot of times some of the best innovations come from you know, looking at other products that already exist, and I see yeah. that that stroller. I, I see yeah. that. Um, so yeah. Um, so uh, now we're gonna move into some a little more questions. Um, can you tell us about a time when you failed and and what you did afterwards? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the first the first production I sort of meant, I alluded to it. Um, we were producing specs there. Um, we we produce overseas. If you ever do a Kickstarter campaign, people get really excited. You tell them like, it'll be here in a year, but they, they don't want it a year. They want it like a month later. Um, so we had a lot of uh, anxious customers, and we had to move quickly. Anytime you produce something the first time, um, it's going to be a challenge, and not to be there a novel design. I mean, we just had a lot of product issues, so. I would say that was the most obvious failure. You, you've now delivered thousands of chairs to households in, a, in the fall, and you had a lot of a lot of product issues. And so, you you know, it, it feels like it feels like it's uh, you know it's doom and gloom. You have to you get obviously grits up there. You have to keep pushing. For us, what we ended up just doing, like our our customer service was fantastic at the time, and I think that really saved the company. We were able to create relationships. Get them replacements. Make sure that um, that that we remove as much hassle as we could from from that experience. That's clear. That's got to be the most obvious value we've had to date. Um, but what it does do though is it makes you. You know, we were. I was at the the last production a couple months ago. I was there a year ago, right after they had opened up. Um, China opened up the their travel policy. So. It just it makes you get closer to it and make sure you don't you don't do it again. And so that's what we've been working on. Well, thank you for that answer. Um, I was wondering uh, if you can think of you know yourself a couple years back. Um, if you can imagine yourself as one of these students sitting here, what is one piece of advice that you would give yourself, your future or your younger self? It would definitely be more than a couple years back, but I appreciate that. Um, if I would, uh, I would say, um, I, I think when I was coming out, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I mentioned I was a government major. I didn't want to, I didn't want to go to law school. I had only taken a couple of marketing classes, so I didn't know whether, um, you know, whether I was going to do business. I liked it, but I didn't know what I was going to do. So I ended up getting, I was fortunate I worked for a small startup in DC, and I just did a bunch of different things. And so my advice to you, whether if you know what you want to do, that's fantastic. Uh, if you don't, I, I just get get going. Like find something where you can your your, your role and your job is going to be buried, and you'll find you'll figure out where you gravitate. Um, that would be my biggest advice. Well, thank you for that advice, and I hope you guys um you know 
can use that um, as you're thinking about, you know, some of you graduating and others just thinking of your career. Um, and so now we're going to open it up to the audience. Um, if you've written anything on your post-its or there's anything um, you're curious about, um, it could also be about um, your time at William Mary. Um, but if we have any questions, we have this um, <clears throat> catch box mic that we can. Oh, man, yeah. Thanks for coming. Uh, of course. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more specifically about the Kickstarter campaign. That, that might be something interesting to the crowd here. Um, just walk through what that was like for you, how maybe that product looks different than the one that we're looking at here. Yeah. Um, and then I was wondering if you knew that there was a William Mary grad that started Kickstarter. I, I did know that. I, 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 yeah, yeah, I did, I did know that piece. Um, the Kickstarter campaign, we had sort of debated it um, in part because we didn't think uh, there's what's great about Kickstarter, especially now or Indiegogo, either one is uh, they have their pros and cons, but they're um, either one, either one works. Um, what's, what's great about it is it's so mature now that it has like a dedicated following. It's got people that have bought multiple products. And what that means. Um, you probably have to go, my guess is now it's been a few years, and you probably still have to go through an agency to, to find the, those lists. But you can you can get to people that are uh, open and willing to, to buy products on Kickstarter and go to. And so that it's it has developed so much that the, the scale of it is much bigger than it was 10 years ago. The challenge is because it's now a mature sort of industry and category you have a lot of agencies that support it. It's no longer like 10 years ago, if you had a great idea, you might not raise $100,000, but you might raise twenty dollars or $30,000, and it's not gonna cost you anything. You're just you're getting it out, there's just not as many products. Now, there's so many products that it's a fight for attention with Kickstarter backers. And so you probably, unfortunately, have to partner with an agency who's gonna, who's gonna mail, email, people that, that are on their list, or they've got really good, um, to not get too technical, they got they have really good lookalike audiences through Facebook or Instagram, and they can communicate your proposition. And the key is, if you haven't done one, you gotta get momentum like before the campaign and that first couple of days, if you can meet or exceed your target, you just start, it's just like, it's just like searching as an optimization. You just start getting, listed higher and higher in the organic searches uh, for products. And that's where you just see sort of multiplier effects of, of, of uh, people coming in. But it's, a, it, it's one where, it's, to answer the question on the product, you're, you're, you, might, you might have a sense of how to make it, but you haven't made it yet. So you want to be careful not to overpromise um, because it, it, there are going to be some challenges on what you can deliver. Uh, but it is a it is a good way. Like I said, I mean, some people use it for depending on your idea. If you go big, like you get really good returns. Um, some people use it as a way to parlay into like retail. So a lot of people will use it and then get their product into into Target or, or other retailers. And that that's a you know, that's certainly an option too. But I think I, I think my guidance is is to try to. It forces you to, to crystallize the idea. It forces you to build an operational sort of timeline. And that timeline probably needs to be to make it to be able to provide it within a year. It requires you to figure out some sense of how you're going to make it. And then it, it also, you're going to have to develop some communication. That's the, the landing page, but also some advertising. And that process is really good for crystallizing what you want to, what you want to sell. So that's I, I happy to it's a it's a whole nother world. Like I it, we we did it, we we enjoyed it, we got had a good experience, and then our life has not looked anything like that since. But it is a good way. I mean, it is a good way to jumpstart your uh, your your proposition. So happy to talk more if people have specific questions about. Hi. Um so us four, we play in the men's soccer team. Oh, so I nice. Think, I think we can connect with you yeah. in that way. Yeah. Um, 
so I was wondering, um, once you have you have your ideas, so you know what you want to produce, uh, you talk to the engineer, you did all the engineering parts, you know, that's what it's going to look like once you produce it. How hard was it to actually make it work? So all the warehouse process, the fact that you're producing in China, how hard was that? Um, it, yeah, I mean, it, if you could, if you can produce in the U.S., it would be great. I mean, certainly innovation. I came from a world um, in, in food and beverage where you, you really can't even, you can't produce that much internationally. There's just rules and regulations. So a lot of the innovation of co-manufacturing is in the U.S. If you're in a product environment, so whatever your product is, a hat, your watch, whatever that product is, it's most likely going to be produced overseas, and it's most likely going to be produced in China. And that that's it's just challenging. You're uh, you have to find them. You have to you have to um, they have to believe it's a big enough idea uh, to really garner the resources. And then there's language barriers. Um, there's uh, there's there could be differences in quality expectations. I think the answer is like. Um, you got to get there. I mean, we didn't have that luxury at first. We couldn't got there. You got to get there. You got to meet them. You got to see the operation, um, and then you have to be you, you have to be comfortable. You know, you, you fail wisely, but you, you have to expect that you're going to see failures. You're trying to get you're trying to get the you're trying to minimize those. But you're to, to go in thinking. That it's going to be because, as I mentioned, we had an industrial designer here, we had an engineer here. We can collaborate with them in real time. Unless you're living in that country, you, you only have so many touch points. And you, obviously, you can do it over email and shared space, uh, but it, it's limited. And so, and they don't, they're not going to have a ton of time and energy to spend on you. So, you, you have to, you have to figure out what's fundamental to get this into the market. And what are some things that you might be able to make some concessions on? And then know that over the course of a couple of productions, you're going to get better at it. Like, but it's not, I think of uh, everything I talked about, even like the fundraising, a pretty dry market um, at the time, it, it's far away the, the biggest challenge. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, so I know Lay Mary credits themselves as having one of like the strongest alumni networks. So did you utilize that when you were starting this? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I utilized it. Um, I was fortunate um, when when I was in business school, I interviewed uh, at Campbell with a uh, long of business school, Chris Foley, who's still there. He's the he's the president of Campbell North America now. So. Uh, he was he was great and he gave me fantastic advice and also really helped me get in the door. And then here with uh, with this venture, yes, in in very different ways. Like um, some of them are, hey, I I see that you're connected with this person who who's an angel investor. Can you connect me? And they would gladly do it. Other times, it's just you're. You guys are going to leave. Guys and girls are going to leave and have friendships that you'll tap into. We tapped into so many people to to get perspective on it, to give them samples to try. I mean, you know, it's a it's a it's a special place. You'll have those friendships forever. I'm, um, depending on the school, 20, 20, 30 years out, and I still you know, I'm still in contact with them all the time. So yeah, the network is, is I guess multi level. Um, and that's the great thing about a school is quality too. You you'll you'll see. Uh, people in different industries, but then you'll also just have friends that are that are willing and able to, to help you out. So yeah, it, it definitely a big part of it. If anyone here wants to, you know, connect afterwards with you, absolutely, um, yeah, uh, that would be a great opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad I am glad you said that. Though. If you if you do have questions or want to bounce stuff off off me, just please reach out. Ask a question. Um, so obviously you have your main product, the Emma chair, and then all the supporting accessories. Do you see like yourself expanding into different types of chairs? Yeah, I mean we we never intended to be solely a chair company. Um, the the whole I, the the positioning sort of lended itself to you know think about other things that people are taking moments, blankets, drinkware, like lots of 
things that you can add to it. Um, you know, I mentioned cash flow. You're, you're trying to you're trying to grow the core and, and invest in some of those others. So not this year, but hopefully next year we will. On the chair side, it's interesting. Like I, there's there's really two. At least we found two opportunities. One is it's it's not great for the beach, and we we we're explicit when people buy it. Even if someone's like, I can't wait, I'm gonna take it to the beach. We're like, we love the purchase, but please, you know. Uh, you, you don't want this at the beach. Uh, thanks for no thanks. So um, the beach is certainly one spot that's an opportunity. I think the challenge on the engineering has been so long. I think the next product is just going to be simpler to get to market. Um, but we do get requests for the beach. And then the comfort is, is as you know, is like a mattress. It's very subjective. And, and this it has to fit a certain body type. We definitely get desire to make it wider. Um, it's just not as easy to do that. So I think the answer to that question is that the next products will probably be just easier to commercialize. And then we'll come back to check. And also for the positioning, I think if you can start to introduce other products, it feels like it becomes a bit more of, you know, of a brand than just, you know, Yeti is a good example, right? They started with coolers. Now it's, a, it's, not, the, it's not the significant chunk of their business. Um, I think that's where we're trying to go. It's just going to take a little while to do it. But yeah, thanks. That's a good question. The innovation pipeline is one that we talk about all the time. So it's uh, it's it's top of mind. But thanks. Sarah's question um, spawned one for me too. So maybe the, the Tesla analogy is like, this is the, the Model S. Yeah. Right. And at this point, um, there's a certain demographic that's ready for the Model S. Yeah. Is there a Model Three? Uh, and and what features would be available in Model Three? And like, what's the true places DNA that makes it into that product? Yeah, it's a good question. That I'm not as familiar on the test. Is Model Three a, a, a lower cost or a higher cost? So the, the S was the, the first high cost. The yeah. three came a while later in this lower yeah, cost. Lower cost. Yeah. A bigger, bigger market, yeah. mass market. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think we at times we you know you, you play with promotions and you if you can get down to like 120, 110, you, you obviously the volume just takes off. You have to be um, you have to be you have to be comfortable with uh, with that from a margin standpoint, but to, to bring a product like that into the market, I think there's two there's two things we have to figure out. We, we don't have it's a, it's a great idea. We certainly talked about it. There's two things that we have to figure out. The first is because I think the feature to answer your question, I think the feature still have it still has to deliver the comfort and stability. Um, the way to do it is I think to get it a little bit lighter and a little less expensive. And we, the arms that I, that I talked to, just get technical for a second, the arms that open up, it's stamped steel in those arms. And it's because, you know, there are people that are 300, 350 pounds lifting themselves out of that and using the arms to do that. So it took a lot of, of, of engineering to make sure that locking mechanism is strong. But I think lightweighting that will not just lightweight significantly the, the, the overall chair, but get some costs out. Um, lightweighting some of the frame will also do the, do, do the same. I think it's there, and then I think the fabric, our fabric is, is pretty um, expensive. That second one, the first one, we have some ideas. The second one, it's a it's a bit of a challenge, you know, again, just industry-wide. Like, there are two big fabric manufacturers, uh, and they're not, they're not, partnering with true places yet to innovate, but I think it's going to require some, some more innovation in the space. The challenge we have is that we've, um, if you have a sling, if you have a sling fabric in your patio, so if anyone has patio chairs and they have sling fabric, it's meant to be really strong. It's also meant to carry weight, but it, you can't, you don't fold it. And if you did fold it, it would create a lot of memory. There'd be a lot of creases and wrinkles and it wouldn't look good when it's open. So we have to create a fabric that is soft enough to do that, but also fold. And so it, it took us a while to find this one and it's expensive. I, I think the, the answer to, to this on your features is get a lightweight, try to get some costs out there and then find a different fabric that can still hold the body and weight, <laughs> but at a lower cost. And so that, 
that feels that you know if if the if the other innovation is next year, that feels a couple of years away at the at the earliest, unfortunately. But it's a it's a good idea. Thanks. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we run out of time, but um, I want to thank you again for taking your time um, and, and driving here yeah, um, and sharing your insights. Um, and it's been really interesting to learn about true places and your entrepreneurial journey. Um, and with that, that concludes our guest speaker portion. Can we give a round of applause?